Let's continue along those lines and focus on system twins. Our next guest is Olivier Devec, Apollo Program Professor of Astronautics and Engineering Systems at MIT. He's going to take us inside the growing complexity of systems and products. And he will focus on how this increasing complexity that we all know is in fact yielding greater performance and resilience and argue how important it is for him to conserve complexity and what that means. So Olivier, the floor is yours. Okay, well, thank you, Patrick. Uh, thank you, Dassault System. Welcome, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here with you. And uh, yeah, let's start talking about complexity. And I think when we think about the future, we should always start about the past and history. So I want to tell you a little bit about uh, how do we propose to measure complexity uh, and manage complexity. And I want to start with a historical example. So as was introduced, uh, I'm a professor right across the river here, the Charles River, that is, at MIT. And uh, we do airplanes and satellites and rockets. And one of the key milestones, maybe the key milestone in our field, was the 1903 first flight of a heavier-than-air, fully controlled aircraft by the Wright brothers. And here's an illustration of what the Wright, uh, Wright Flyer looked like. By the way, um, our Building 33 was the first place where it was publicly displayed to the public. And you can see it was very in a very inventive machine. Um, there's actually a great book uh, that was written by David McCullough, a very famous historian who passed away last year, the Wright Brothers biography. It's a fantastic description of how they went from making bicycles to making airplanes. How they spent years in the sand dunes of North Carolina observing birds flying is really a bio-inspired design. You can see the wings have a wing warping mechanism with cables. The pilot is laying down and moving their hip. It's by moving their hips that they're warping the wings. In this case, the elevator is in the front. And um, it, was, it was an amazing flying machine. And we can ask the question, well, how complex was that machine? To answer that question, what we need to do is we need to decompose the aircraft into its different subsystems and parts. And I've done that here. Uh, I've decomposed it. And, and the question is always, how far down do you decompose it? So you need to decompose it down enough to so get some insights. Uh, so here's an 18 by 18 DSM, or dependency structure matrix. So it's a square matrix. Each row and column represents a part of the aircraft. For example, we have the wing, and we have the fuselage, and we have the bicycle wheel hub, and um, the, the hip cradle that you saw. And the different colors here, the different off-diagonal cells, represent the different interfaces or connections between the parts. So in black, we have physical connections, right? Part A connects with part B. That's always a symmetrical connection, right? If A connects to B, B connects to A. That's why all the black entries here are symmetric. The red, uh, uh, the red entries are mass flows, flow of fuel. This engine, by the way, was water-cooled, right? It was an aluminum engine, one of the very first aluminum engines. It was water-cooled and the water tank. Um, and the airflow, of course. The energy flow is essentially the torque generated by the engine and transmitted to the propeller. And yes, there was information flow. It was not a fancy cockpit, but even the right flyer had an anemometer to measure the, the speed of flight. And so we find, a, um, we find 62 physical connections, four mass flows, 11 energy flows, nine information flows, and a total density of that matrix of about 7%. The other thing really interesting is the average number of interfaces of each part is about five. And believe it or not, that number is almost an invariant. If you look at the latest airplanes by Airbus or Boeing, also each component has roughly five to six connections maximum. So there's some invariance at play here. Um, some of you might have heard of Augustine's Law. Norm Augustine was a former CEO of Lockheed Martin. I actually had the pleasure of seeing him yesterday. He was here at MIT to celebrate the retirement of one of my colleagues at MIT. 
And so I talked to Norm literally last night about the 16th law. And in this law, which he started working on this or publishing this uh, in the 1980s, this is kind of funny. He's predicting that um, you see the different airplanes. These are all military aircraft uh, starting you know, World War II. The, the cost, the acquisition cost of a single airplane. And we have the F-15 there, the F-14, the B-52, the F-35. And if you project that out to the end of the century, the entire defense budget would only be able to uh, buy one airplane, and that by 2150, the entire gross national product could only afford one airplane. And of course, you know, it's meant to be funny, but uh, actually, <laughs> we're still tracking. So there's the right flyer that I just show you in blue in the lower left. And I added to this chart the very latest airplane that was um, uh, unveiled by um, the Secretary of Defense a couple months ago, and that's the B-21, the replacement of the B-2. And that airplane is going to cost about $750 million per copy, and it's right on the line. It's right on the line in 2023. So we still keep basically increasing the cost per unit quite a bit. The question is, why? What's driving this increase in cost? Well, a lot of it is because, you know, a B-21 can do a lot more than a Wright Flyer. It can fly halfway around the world. It's almost invisible to radar, you know, its radar cross-section is very, very low. Um, and it has a lot of other functions. This chart shows you what I call the requirements explosion in aviation since really uh, before World War II, but certainly after the war. So we have the Wright Flyer. What was the requirement for the Wright Flyer? Take off, sustain your own weight, fly in a straight line. The Wright brothers actually, not a lot of people cared that it's possible to fly in the first few years. They actually didn't believe that flight was possible. So the Wright brothers, Wright brothers had to pack up their Wright Flyer into boxes. They shipped it across the Atlantic. And in France, in Paris, around a big racetrack, they did demonstrations for tens of thousands of people. This is like 1907, 1908 until be people actually started believing that flight was possible. So you had to be able to do maneuvers, right? And gust alleviation when there was wind. But you can see a lot more requirements since then. And so an example of an aircraft that um, has been heavily criticized, but is also now very successful um, commercially as well, uh, is, the James, uh, is, is the JSF, the Joint Strike Fighter, the F-35, which, by the way, a lot of the uh, Dassault system tools and, and environments have been essential in designing that, that aircraft. The aircraft itself is very complex. It comes in three variations. You see the structure, the hydraulics, the electrics, the vertical lift. Um, but even if you just look at the helmet, just the pilot helmet of the Joint Strike Fighter is incredible. It has a lot of intelligence in it. Um, you can look around, and the airplane is invisible to you, to the pilot, so you can look behind you. It's all virtual. And there are millions of lines of code just in the helmet of the Joint Strike Fighter. So we now have an explanation for this um, escalation in costs that is predicted and actually empirically validated uh, from Augustine's law. And DARPA actually did a pretty detailed analysis of what is causing this, this increase in cost. You can see on this chart uh, roughly 10% per year. About 3% per year, so all the blue factors on this chart are due to inflation that we experience in every sector of the economy, material, equipment, labor. So there's nothing special there. But the next chunk is the complexity increase. And you can see that's, that's about 5% per year. 5% per year cost escalation due to complexity. But we're, of course, getting a lot more functionality and a lot more value for that. So the point here is let's think really deeply about complexity in our design processes and our different products. But to do that, we need to really unpack it. And 
Uh, the research we've done at MIT has really uncovered that there are three areas where complexity matters. First of all, functional complexity. So in the upper left here, we have our customers, our competitors, and our regulators. If you're regulating a lot of uh, decarbonization, for example, safety regulations, all of those become uh, generators or requirements. Those requirements generate functional complexity. The functional complexity then drives structural complexity because we have to implement all these functions, right? Through software, through hardware, also through human, human operations. So humans, hardware, and software together give us the structural complexity. And then the third dimension is organizational complexity. Who's going to design these systems, manufacture them, integrate them, test them, and validate them? And many of the organizations, including uh, Lockheed Martin, which is the lead uh, organization behind the, James, uh, the, the Joint Strike Fighter, uh, are geographically distributed. So geographical distribution adds another um, dimension of complexity. And so some of you might have ho heard of Conway's Law. Conway's Law is a homomorphism, says that if you look, if you look at the architecture of a physical product, it often mirrors the architecture of the organization that created that product. So we have this kind of two-way interaction. And then finally, um, the, the cost and schedule, so the non-recurring engineering cost, the NRE, and the schedule, how long it takes us to develop a new product, is driven by the organizational complexity, which is driven by the structural complexity, which is driven by the functional complexity. And of course, we have two-way interactions. So that's, in a sense, the, the really big picture here. And the question is, well, is this just chaos or is this predictable and manageable? So our research uh, is trying to really put, uh, expose the underlying principles and laws behind these complexities. And to put it in the simplest possible terms, I'm gonna label functional complexity as P, that's performance, structural complexity as C for complexity, and then E, the organizational complexity, is effort, the effort required. So if you think about it, the required performance drives the structural complexity, C, and the structural complexity drives the effort required to design, build, and validate the system. Okay, now how do we actually measure complexity? And I'm gonna focus here on structural complexity. This is the structural complexity equation that we developed a number of years ago. We've been working on this for close to a decade now, and it has this form, C1 plus C2 times C3. Now, where's that coming from? It's actually coming from uh, quantum chemistry. Uh, chemists were dealing with very complex molecules. They use that same form of the equation. It's based on the Hamiltonian. So what does that mean? So C1, C1 is the complexity that's coming from the individual components, right? So if you took a car and you, you decompose the car, you disassemble the car, and you spread everything out on the parking lot, including the software, if you can imagine that, you still have complexity, right? It's the complexity of each of the individual parts, that was what you see in this picture. C2 is the complexity to pairwise, pairwise interactions pairwise interfaces between the parts. And then C3 is the most interesting, and that's the one that most people that do complexity quantification, they forget about, they do C1 and C2, they forget about the role of C3. C3 is the topology, the network topology of your system. And the, the topology has complexity in its own right. Okay, so, this, is this meaningful? Can we do anything with it? Does it mean anything to us humans? So we did some experiments, you know, empirical experiments in the lab with, with individual test subjects to understand what is the relationship between complexity, as I've just shown you, we quantify complexity, and effort, how long it takes to do a task. And we started doing very, very simple tasks. So this is from uh, several years ago, we've, we've done more experiments recently which confirm this result. So the x-axis here is structural complexity. What is the task that we ask them to do? Remember your chemistry classes in high school, right? You probably got like one of those kits with the, ball, the balls and sticks model, 
right? The, I think the oxygen, mod, uh, the oxygen molecules are blue or green. Uh, hydrogen is red. I forget all the colors. The point is when you assemble the model of the molecule using these stick and ball models, you're replicating the structure of the actual physical molecule. So we gave the test subjects different molecules to build and we increased the complexity. And if they made a mistake, and we, we timed them, we didn't give them any time limits. We'd take as long as you need, but it has to be correct. So if you make a mistake, you have to correct that mistake, and that time that, that it takes to do the error correction is included in your total build time. So what you see on this chart is um, the, the mean build time for these molecules for um, 17 different test subjects and 12 different models or molecules of increasing complexity. And what we found is that the effort, the time required, goes up super linearly with complexity. So if I give you a molecule to build that's 50% more complex than another molecule, it's gonna take you more than 50% more time. It's gonna take you almost double the time, like 80% more time. Because it's, it's more than linear, but it's less than quadratic, the, the exponent is about 1.5 or 3 over 2. And that's really significant. And, and we think this, this super linearity, more complexity, more effort, but more than linear, explains why so many projects that we're doing are um, over time and over budget. Because when we uh, budget for these projects, we often neglect this. So this is an empirical result. Um, then if we look at real products, um, we find very interesting things. Uh, so here's an example from work we did with Pratt & Whitney. This is the uh, aircraft engine manufacturer. Um, on the left side, you see an, quote, old engine. It's actually an engine that's still in use today. It's the main engine used on the 777. It's a direct drive. Um, it's a direct drive two spool turbofan engine. And then on the right side, you see the latest engine, which is the gear turbofan. It's also two stages, but it's a, it's a geared engine. So it has a gearbox between the fan and the low pressure spool. It has a lot of more complexity. It has uh, extra lubrication systems. It has more software. And we found that um, that new engine has 42% more complexity than the old engine. It gives you a lot of benefits. It gives you about 15% less fuel consumption, which is a big deal in today's day and age. Um, it also gives you 70% less noise. So there are a lot of benefits, but you're paying for those benefits with quite a bit of extra complexity. And a lot of that complexity is not just the extra parts, but it's the extra interfaces. And you can sort of visually see that that network of parts on the right side is, is more complex than the one on the left. We've also worked with Xerox and found very similar trends in uh, printing systems, digital printing systems. And then when you look across longer periods of time, and I'm talking now for decades, different uh, architectures of engines, we found this curve, which to me is amazing, that we can predict re the relationship between performance and complexity with such a tight fit. So what is performance here? Uh, performance is essentially one over fuel burn. So TSFC is thrust specific fuel consumption. How much fuel are we burning per second per unit of thrust, per Newton of thrust? And then the x-axis is complexity, the equation that I showed you, normalized by the gear turbofan, the latest uh, generation. So that's one one. Look how predictable that is. Basically, what this shows you is we're, for air breathing propulsion, we have reached the flat part of the S-curve. We can still get improvements, but every percent improvement in performance is gonna cost us more and more in terms of complexity. And we can parameterize that equation, and it becomes very predictable. And we can map on this complexity equation essentially all of the jet engines that have been built since the beginning of the jet age. So A is a turbojet engine, B is a two-stage turbojet, uh, C is a turbofan engine, and then D is the gear turbofan that I just showed you. And so this, this is very encouraging in a sense 
because uh, there's regularities, there's laws underlying this complexity performance relationship. Um, I do wanna give a shout out here to INCOSI, the International Council of System Engineering. I've been a member of INCOSI for many years. Um, they have a vision 2035, and in that vision they say that system engineering needs a stronger scientific and mathematical grounding based on advanced practices, heuristics, observable phenomena, and formal ontologies so that we can maximize the value of our systems for particular applications. So this going deeper on complexity quantification and management plays directly into this vision, supports this vision. So um, if you haven't had enough equations yet, <laughs> I got a couple more for you, but I promise you these are my last equations. So I'm gonna say something really provocative, which is that th there's a heuristic in system engineering called KISS, right? Keep it simple, stupid. The simplest solution is the best. And what we found is that's true sometimes, but not always. Um, so on the left, the left curve is the performance curve that we just saw, so more performance, but then you have saturation at more complexity. The, the right curve is the one that you saw in the experiment, right? More complexity uh, costs more effort, but it's super linear. So it turns out if we define value as the ratio of performance of a system over the non-recurring engineering effort, we can find the maximum value ratio. What is the maximum value point? And so where do we maximize value depending on the work we put into designing the system and the performance out, right? When the, perform when the architecture is very mature, we could spend enormous effort for 1% improvement, and that may not add value. So it turns out uh, these exponents are the critical ones, uh, N and M, uh, that describe these two equations. So when N is smaller than M, the heuristic of keeping it as simple as possible is correct. But when n is greater than m, you get, uh, the equa you get this curve, this uh, basically concave curve that has an optimal point. And so um, let me show you an example. Oh, so, and then model-based system, system engineering, what does it do for us? Well, fundamentally, model-based engineering and the digital engineering tools of today help us uh, change the slope of that curve of um, effort to complexity. So we can handle designing more complex systems with less effort. That's the key point. So a very simple example here would be here. So P max is two. You see the, fa the parameters K, the exponents N and M. And um, this is you know, a generic example, but it would show you that what you really wanna find is that peak of the curve here, the peak of the value curve, and that would give you the target complexity that you should use to design your system, C star. And this is, we don't do that today in most products, right, in most product development products, projects. So my message to you is let's start doing explicit complexity quantification. And I think there's a deeper analogy here between system engineering and system science, conservation of complexity, and the more classic disciplines that we know, like thermodynamics, right? Conservation of energy. The change in internal energy of a system, delta U, is equal to the heat that we put in minus the work that the system performs. Similarly, in systems design, the change in complexity of the system, structural complexity, is equal to the change in performance that the system will give us minus the effort that we have to spend to get that performance. And there's a lot of data out there that validates that this first law is true. And if you're trying to basically cut corners um, and develop really complex systems with less effort, uh, but you don't do it well, you're going to be below the line and your mission or your product will fail or it'll be impaired. So my key messages are complexity has been increasing. Um, it's driven by customers, competition, regulation. Uh, there are rigorous ways to quantify complexity, and we've proposed one of those measures. And the first law of system science and engineering proposed is conservation of complexity. So, and violating that first law, you can do at your own peril. So I hope this is useful, and uh, 
I hope we have time for maybe one or two questions, but thank you very much. Thank you so much, Olivier. I hope you hear me. Uh, this is why I love so much engineering, in fact. Thank you so much. Uh, one question and then the audience. Uh, performance, complexity, effort. I understand you are talking about closed system here. If I take two systems, like in systems or systems or swarms, and I put them together, is it still valid? That's a great question. Um, for sure, if you have two systems that were previously separate, you can calculate their individual complexities and what they give you. And I think it's interesting when you combine the systems and cross-strap them to create a bigger system of systems, you should be able to, to, to quantify the complexity of that new system of systems. It's emergent right. instead of a... But now, will the performance, act, will it be worthwhile, right? Or will those systems actually have some negative interactions mm -hmm and will actually be worse than keeping them separate, that's worth some thought. I'm thinking about urban systems, for example. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But I'm, I'm reasonably sure that you can quantify their complexities separately and together, but the performance side is trickier. Any questions from the audience? If not, I have another one. Bernard, the mic is coming. Thank you very much, Olivier, for this uh, exciting presentation. Do you think in, in, the, um, in the industry, do you think uh, core suppliers we, will accept to communicate the complexity of, of the <laughs> black boxes? Um, on, is there a trend? That, that? that is a great question. So the, the black box from the um, tier one, tier two, tier three supplier looks to the OEM like a single part, right? And I believe that if you specify how the complexity should be enumerated and calculated without revealing you know, IP and, to, and, and the secret sauce in the box that suppliers would be willing to do that, yes. But, but you'd have to do it rigorously, yeah. And, and hopefully, so for Dassault System, you know, a lot of the tools that you have are, are amazing, but if they could help quantify the complexity automatically and help with complexity management across supplier OEM boundaries, that would be revolutionary. Could we uh, imagine modular-based system, complexity-based? Yes, and, and we have done some work on uh, uh, the modularity index versus complexity. Oh, interesting. So more modular systems, by the way, are not always less complex. They're often more complex because in modularity, you are um, duplicating things. So each module is simpler, but the modular system is more complex because it is modular, but you get other benefits. That's very interesting. OK. Other questions? A very quick last question. Related to uh, safety, uh, safety system, you know, on, uh, of course, the multiple system you need to put in place to increase. Have you evaluated in your theory, for example, for aircraft or other critical <laughs> systems, how the multiplication of systems or the decoupling uh, could, be, uh, could be managed with this uh, complexity factor? It, it's a really interesting question. My colleague, Professor Levison, Nancy Levison, studies system safety. In fact, she's running a conference these days over at MIT. A lot of the reason why complexity increases is the countermeasures against failure modes. But the more complexity we add, the more failure modes sometimes we generate. So it's, it's a two-way interaction. I think we had maybe one more question here. Eric, there's a mic behind. Cheers. <laughs> well, thank you, Ali. I appreciate the uh, the presentation. So, going to the back, maybe towards the beginning of your presentation, you talked about uh, measuring or looking, inspecting to the depth of where there's value. As 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 I look at the presentation that happened just before you, uh, there's a lot of obviously emerging understanding in the space of modeling. Right? Do you have any guidelines or recommendations you would you would would tell the rest of us based on your, your discussion now just about the complexity of modeling. But as we start to, where, where do we go 
right, at a top level to, to – because you can get very deep into the details of analysis, but uh, – so, so, do you remember I showed you on the right flyer the number of interfaces on the right flyer of each part was about five? So, um, there's this seven plus or minus two magic number. And if, in an idealized way, you decompose every part into seven subparts, six or seven subparts, you can actually say how many levels of nesting or decomposition do we need, ideally? And my view is that um, if you're a subsystem supplier, a parts manufacturer, or an OEM, you should have visibility at least two levels down, right? So one level down would be seven major subsystems, and then seven squared is 49, you know, between, between um, 25 and 81. You need to have that, at the minimum, that, that visibility. If you added another level, you'd have you know, 300 parts, and you'd have to know everything about them. And so that's where I think between a two and three level decomposition is where the action really is. OK, thank very you. interesting. Well, thank you very much, Olivier. That was uh, really inspiring. And I guess we have a, plan, a development, development plan now for our next uh, systems engineering solutions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm wondering if there's a, a first slow for virtual twins as well in terms of complexity handling.